Hey guys. Hello. Hold on just a second. Um, let me lower the volume on that. That's not right. So let's delete that. Nope, that's not right. Hey guys. Okay, so we are about to go live with Carrie. I need to make sure that I'm not on private. I'm not. Okay. Hold on just a second, okay? I'm going to share this video around, um, and then I'm going to get Carrie on here. She'll, she'll be in here just a second, and as soon as she's on to share her story with you guys, but I just want to share. Why did that go black when I'm literally live right now? That shouldn't have done that. Okay. All right. I'm going to share this video. That's what I'm trying to do. Sorry. Um. <laughs> hey, Carrie, I see you back there, girl. Hold on just a second. I'm going to share the video on Facebook and stuff first before we do anything, okay? So, share into a group. There we go. Hey, everybody. Come on in. Come hang out with us. Okay. Why does it keep doing that? That's strange. It keeps trying to, like, not film me. And I'm like, why is it doing that? <laughs> Stop doing that, phone. Okay. Okay. There it goes, going dark again. You see that? Hold up. That's going to make me upset. Okay. My son has his friend over, so they're wreaking havoc. On our whole house. Okay, there we go. I got enough. I think I shared it enough. Okay, now what I want to do is I, I think I might switch over from my phone to my computer, you guys, because for some reason I'm fit, trying to film here and my camera is trying to stop while, while it's recording. So let's grab my computer because I can do it on there too. It might be clearer. Um, so it will probably be clearer and it'll be more light too. That's my friend's book. Yeah. His, he's a guy that follows me on TikTok and he wanted me to review it. So I told him I would. Let me show it to you. See, it just shut off. Did you? Can you all see that? Huh, that's so strange. Hold on just a second. Bear with me, y'all. Bear with me. Bear with me. This book, my... Seven Steps from Addiction to, Sobri to Sobriety by Derek Moore. Um, I follow him on TikTok. He's a pretty cool kid. Okay. I hate when my, um, it just is like acting weird. Like it shouldn't be even getting darker. Do I have it on like a wrong setting or something? Hey, Paco, come on up. Our, our co-host is coming. Get your spot, co-host. Good job. <laughs> That's our co-host. <laughs> Let's see if I can get on. Of course, it's going to give me problems. Okay. Hold on just a second, you guys. No word. Okay, six digit code. Where's my other phone? <sighs> Hold on just a second. Boop. It is three seven six two one two. Okay. Three seven six. Okay, here we go. Enter studio. Just do it this way. I'm back. Okay, sorry about that, you guys. For some reason, my phone was like throwing me off. So, fuck that phone. <laughs> hey, Carrie. What are you doing, girl? 
Not a whole lot. Can you hear me good? Yeah, I can. Okay, good. Perfect. All right, cool. Okay, sorry about the dilemma. I was trying to get on here and it kept on throwing me up like it was it was like it was going black. The screen was and I'm like, I'm recording like it wasn't seeing my face or something. So screw that. Okay, I'm excited to hear your story. So it's really chill here. You ain't have to worry about if you got kids in the background. It's okay because I'm sure my son will run in here. I got my dog back there co-hosting. So we're all good. Um, start out and share with us about what it was like when you were a kid growing up. Um, you know, just like maybe if you came from a two-parent household, if you um, if your parents struggled with addiction, that kind of thing. And then just take us into how you got into your addiction, um, what it was like in addiction, how you got sober, and then what your life is like now. If I have any questions, I'm going to ask. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to mute myself and I'm going to start sharing the video to a whole bunch of other groups, Okay. All right, sounds good. So you got total control. All right, cool. So growing up, you know, my parents separated, got divorced when I believe I was about four years old. Um, my dad had like a really big secret and my mom found out that he was gay. She caught him and they got a divorce. And that was really traumatic for me. I was a really big daddy's girl. Once they divorced and were like in the process of that, he started drinking a lot you know, living out of hotel rooms and just not like he wasn't who we knew. You know, he started changing a lot. And whenever I'd see him, he was always drunk. And one time, like this is a memory that sticks with me to this day. Like it's so vivid of when he took me to 7-Eleven to get um, ice cream. And he ended up drinking so much that he peed himself in the checkout line. And they kicked us out of the 7-Eleven. And as a kid, you know, I was just like, why is my dad so different? Why doesn't he love me? Why isn't he spending time with me? I miss him. And now as an adult, you know, I see what it really was. And he's still a really bad alcoholic to this day. Really? Um, yeah. Damn, I don't really man. So I tell me one thing. Like, did kids make fun of you or did they not know about that at school? Or did you get shit from, from your friends at school? Um, I was really quiet. Like, I didn't have a lot of friends growing up. Um, there were a couple times where friends asked me, like, where's your dad? And I would just say, you know, that he's working or he's doing whatever. But they didn't. I didn't really get made fun of until I was diagnosed with diabetes. When I was a really young kid, I got diagnosed when I was eight. And, you know, all the friends I had come, like, made like got weirded out when I started having to take shots every day and they didn't want to be my friend for that reason. How did you get, well, my sister just got diagnosed with type two diabetes. So I don't, I don't really know a lot about diabetes, I guess you could say. So how did you end up getting it at a young age? Was it just like hereditary? No. So I have um, an aunt and an uncle who have type two and ironically enough, like they're also alcoholics and the one just passed away from alcoholism this last year. Mm -hmm. um, mine was, a, was traumatic. So at a young age, I was sexually assaulted by two different men. Um, one was like a friend of the family and the other was my uncle. And because of all the stress on my body at such a young age, um, the doctor said that there's a few different things that can happen. And one of them is an organ shutting down. And that's what happened to me was my pancreas shut down from all the stress on my body. I am so sorry. Like that is fucked up. Like, yeah. but I mean, that can happen. So you were young, you started getting, I mean, that happens to you. You don't know how to process what has happened to you? You don't feel comfortable probably talking about it to anybody. I'm sure if you were like anything like me, you probably kept it a secret for a really long time, you know, and then when you finally did let it out, all these things started happening to your body and then you got diabetes. That I've, I've, I've had many people come on my, on here and tell their stories. And that is probably the first time that I've ever heard that have ever happening, but damn, I believe you that it happened. That's so, that's hardcore. So when yeah. you found out you had diabetes, did you tell, okay, so tell us, did you tell somebody that you were being abused when you told your family or somebody that, did they believe you? So the first time I was sexually abused was by my dad's girlfriend's daughter's boyfriend. Take a minute to let that sit in. Um, 
So my mom had seen blood in my underwear and that's how it all came about. I must have blocked it out because I had no idea what she was talking about. And my grandma, which she plays into the other part, um, she had said something about a guardian angel. And, you know, my mom asked me if my dad was doing it. And, you know, I'm like thinking about it. And I started praying to my guardian angel and an image of what had happened popped into my head. And I'm like, the guy's name was John. And I told her John did it. And, you know, John confessed to everything. And he only did six months and got probation. So, and then the second time I reached out because I knew it was wrong. Um, I even told my uncle to his face that he was sick. And then I had wrote on the back, Okay, I'm jumping ahead. So I told my grandmother that it was going on with my uncle. And she told me if I wanted to have a good Christmas, a good Thanksgiving, to keep it hush hush. That I would ruin things, I would break up the family, and that I would go to hell. That makes me so fucking mad. (laughs) You have no idea. Like, you should believe your children if they ever come to you and tell you anything about anything like this. You don't ever say oh, don't tell anybody because you won't have a good Christmas. I mean, who cares about that, you know? Yeah. So, you know, I wrote on the back of a, my mom had no idea. Um, So I wrote on the back of a receipt. So I was saving up money to get my mom this jewelry set from JCPenney for Christmas. And on the back of that receipt, my uncle had kind of like bribed me. He gave me the rest of like the $50 to get it. And on the back of the receipt, I wrote, Mom, Uncle Matt did this to me. And I put it in my pocket. Now, at the time, we lived in these apartment buildings. And down the street, there was a house of a man who had a son. And he would walk me to school. My mom was a single mom and struggling with three jobs. And so he would make sure that I got to school safe. And that fell out of my pocket onto his couch. And while he was cleaning his mom's house he found it and he gave it to my school and you know told them what he had found and then cps got involved and when they showed up the first time i denied 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 i'm like nothing happened i was so scared and then they left and it was just me and my mom and i had like a full-on breakdown like telling her what had happened what my grandmother said telling her you know she put me in the car with my uncle matt And she literally put me in the car with this piece of shit, drove down a side street and was like, so Carrie said that you, you guys were doing this. And like, he turned around and gave me the most evil look they both did. And crazy enough, my grandmother knew about two of my other cousins that he was raping from the time they were eight until they were 18 and made them not say anything, said the same spiel to me, that you'll break up the family, you'll go to hell for putting your uncle in jail, like blah, blah, blah. So, yeah. So my grandma- basically, your grandmother was complicit in helping him rape young girls. Yes. She should Our do family. prison time too. She should. She should, but she got her karma. This year she had a stroke and she's permanently like, she can't walk, she can't talk. They don't think she'll ever do it again. Like, so she got her karma. It took some time. Yeah, she sure did. Because that is like, she might as well have been like delivering you to him. You know what I mean? That is so messed up. Like, yeah, yeah, I mean, okay, keep on going. So, so this is how, that's how you ended up, your, your pancreas ended up shutting down. Cause how old were you when this happened? Um, the first time I was six and the second time I had just turned seven. Damn. Okay. Your poor little body didn't know what to do. You were probably so scared. I've been through like, uh, not as, not, uh, not as bad. It's, it's, my experience was not even compared to that, but it was enough for me to be afraid to tell anybody. And so I can't even imagine how you felt. And then having that your mom put you in that, or your grandmother puts you in the position where you're like in the same area with him and then being like, did you really do this? Like, did he, did he admit to it or did he deny it? Um, he denied it at first, but then years later, he actually came out and said that he did it all to everybody because, you know, I had, after my story had come out and people found out about me, 
<clears throat> my two cousins, you know, they blame themselves for a while. Like, we let this happen to her. Like, we should have spoke up. But it took him some years. I think I was about 10 or 11 before he finally wrote letters apologizing to everything. But he did it in a sick way. Like, the first time he did it to me, um, he made me touch him on the couch. And he drew a picture of that. He sent it to my mom and wrote a letter apologizing. So, like, really sick in the head. Yeah. Dude. He must have been just, like, real messed up all his life to be thinking that was okay. Yeah, well, there's so, a lot of abuse, I guess, like, when they were kids. Um, there's rumors in the family of, like, my grandmother doing that to him and my grandfather touching, you know, this my mom and her sisters and stuff like that. I, and I understand that, but that doesn't – I truly believe that you don't have to repeat those same yeah. behaviors. I mean, you have children yeah. – you're not yeah. doing that to your children. Oh, no. You know, because you know that's wrong and it's not, you know, right from wrong. And when we get old enough to understand right from wrong, we know better. Okay. So once you got, you found out you had diabetes when you were younger, tell me, take us from there. Sorry, I didn't mean to get so in depth with that part, but it just kind of, okay. I just wanted to know because I feel like that has a lot to do with why we become, we get addicted and, and you know, in the future and stuff. Yeah, a lot of trauma, undiagnosed and untreated trauma. Um, but back to yours, it was like you said, it wasn't as big. It doesn't matter if it's big or small. It's all the same amount of traumatic. It all sucks and nobody should go through it. But, Absolutely. you know, I had a pretty good, I went through a lot of panic attacks and anxiety and depression after that. School was really hard. We moved. My mom got remarried. We moved to Michigan to a really small town in the country. And once I got into school, I met some friends, one girl of which I'm still really close with to this day. We met in middle school and things got easier from there. My story of my addiction starts my senior year of high school. Um, well, my brother passed away when I was 13. So in a car accident, he wasn't wearing a seatbelt and he hit a patch of black ice. And he was like my father, my best friend and my brother all in one. He was my older brother. Um, we were 10 years apart. So back to senior year, I had just broken up with my high school sweetheart. I still had a lot of things that were untreated dealing with my brother and obviously the sexual abuse and a lot of things going on with my dad. So I felt really lost and really hopeless. I struggle with like pushing friends away when I enter a relationship. It's like they become my main focus and nothing else in the world matters. So I, I was the was same way. <laughs> Just so you know. <laughs> yeah. So I was on the journey for new friends and I found, uh, we'll call her Amber. I met this girl named Amber and we became like this, you know, and eventually we were smoking weed before school. We were smoking weed during school. Like at lunch, we'd go out to my car and we would smoke and we'd smoke right after pulling out the parking lot, like smoking weed all the time. And for me, it was like something that I can medicate myself with. You know, I had gone to parties and drank and popped like Xanax and pills and stuff, but it wasn't like something I could get my hands on whenever I wanted, like we was. So I was smoking a lot and we graduated and decided, you know what? We want a lot of money. We want the, the apartment. We want cars. We want purses and shoes. And we decided to become best friend strippers at 18 and the club that we worked at. Hold on, hold on. My, you have no idea, like you just said, like part of my senior year. So me, I had three best friends, Sonia, Miranda, and um, Sonia, Miranda, and Tammy. And Sonia and Miranda became strippers, but I was like this close to doing it. But I was so afraid that my dad or one of his friends would come in there or something and see me. So I didn't do it. But my two best friends in high school, they did. One of them is like a lawyer now. And the other one is like a... A, a psychiatrist or something but they both 
are like really successful. So yeah, yeah, yeah good, good jobs. Pay for college and everything else, which is why a lot of girls in there do it. When you talk to them and you meet a bunch of uh, dancers, they tell you I'm paying for college or, you know, I'm trying to get myself out of this situation or into a better home or whatever the case may be. Like, it's not. That's exactly what these two girls did. They paid their way through college. So, I mean, yeah. I mean, look at me. I didn't go. To, I failed out of college after two years. So, like, that's why when I was younger, I would have judged somebody that was a stripper. But now that I'm older and I see that a lot of people who do who do strip or do sex work, they're not doing it because they're like. They're doing it because they're trying to get a means to an end or make a better life for themselves, you know? So I yeah. totally support it. I totally support sex workers and strippers. I think that you got to do whatever you got to do to get to where you're going. And if you're uh, making a better life for yourself, that's all that matters. Yeah, I support whatever anybody wants to do. I mean, I pro body, pro choice. So if that's what you feel like you have to do or want to do to get yourself out Agreed. of the situation then go yeah. for it so that's what we had decided and the club that we had worked at um they let us drink even though they knew we were 18 you know they kind of just said keep it hush hush and if so and so comes in you're not drinking that night blah 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 so we were dancing day shift and night shift like we were going hard like we wanted all of the money and we got a lot of shit for it because of how much we worked and how, I guess, not little other people worked. But we were there all the time. So I met um, her cousin, which full name, we'll name him Seth. I met her cousin that came back from a Florida treatment center. And they are an addict. And, you know, we were so tired. And they said, well, I can get you something to keep you up. And so they wanted to relapse and to make themselves feel better, they got us our Coke. And so we started doing Coke and popping Adderall and doing, every, and doing a bunch of it. Like it turned into a full blown Coke addiction for me. And I was doing it a lot, like going through a lot of money really fast, like eight balls, teeners, everything in a day. So eventually it got super expensive between the three of us splitting these bags. And they're like, you know what? We, I have another way that will save us money, which introduced IV drug use. And the drug world was still so new to me. You know, like I had experimented with some things here and there, but I had never IV drug used anything, like shot up anything. So they did it for me the first time. And I was in the backseat of my mom's truck at the time. And I still remember that day because that's the day that everything changed for me. Like, it was a whole new ballpark. Like, a whole new world. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I know. I know. Yeah. Same for me. So, from there, you know, obviously, we, um, I wasn't dancing as much. My friend Amber was, you know, for me, it kind of took over everything for me, even though she was also IV using it. For her, it, it seemed a little different, but I don't really know if it was all that much. But she was still working, holding a job, making new friends. And for me, it was like, that's all I wanted to do. I started manipulating and lying for it and stealing. I put credit cards in my mom's name for it. I would go buy things and sell to my dealer, steal things, whatever it would be to get my hands on that. And eventually I was giving this other girl rides home from work to her hotel room and she did heroin and coke and like anything that she could get her hands on. So one day, you know, I was getting shots of Coke from her. And one day I go in and, you know, I'm mixing it up. She gave it to me. It looked white. I did it, but immediately knew it was something different. And I was like nodding out, sleeping. And I'm like, what did you just give me? And in my head, you know, I'm a big true crime junkie. So I thought she was going to try to like off me. Kill you or something. <laughs> yeah. Wait, what did you just give me? 
And she's like, well, you said you wanted dope. And I'm like, no, I, I said I wanted coke. But at that point, I was like, I fell in love with heroin at that point. And the person I was dating was trying so hard to, like, keep me out of that world. Like, they didn't want to be the first person to give it to me. And when they found out, you know, they were pissed. But, like, you know, they gave in because they wanted eventually to get back into doing it, too. And I was, like, holding them back or whatever. So from there, we started buying bags of heroin and Coke, shooting it every day. And things just got really bad, really fast, you know. Like, at first, it's fun, and you're partying. And like they say, it just it's not fun for much longer. I feel I had, like it gets really bad, really fast shooting cocaine. Yeah. I don't know what it is. Uh, I mean, meth too. And I don't feel like shooting stimulants in general. It's like you, your mind starts going. At yeah. least that's what in my experience. I start yeah. hallucinating. I start talking to people that aren't there. I start thinking things that are happening or not happening. Yeah. You know, at least when I was shooting opioids, like that doesn't happen. I'm chilling. Yeah. I'm smoking cigarettes. The worst I'm doing is lighting the house on fire because I nodded out with a cigarette. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> exactly. Lighting the house on fire is the, that's the worst thing. <laughs> like, it's good. <laughs> like, if that's the least of my worries, <laughs> as long as I have my drugs, it's okay. <laughs> so i'm so serious like <laughs> my house then see hallucinations dude any day because i'm scared i'm yeah. freaking out I, I can get out of the house but i can't fucking get away from my hallucinations you know what i mean shadow people looking at the people jumping at every little noise like thinking the feds are about to come barging in yeah i understand what you mean it gets scary so we started doing that and, I mean, it got, we just trapped ourselves in a room. We were still staying with my mom at this point. And, you know, my ex would be, like, barricading the door so she couldn't just come barging in and, like, pacing back and forth. And I'm sitting there, like, freaking out because I'm scared to get off the bed. And I had no idea, like, <laughs> what withdrawals were. And my idea of heroin when I first started it is you do it and you die. Like, there's no, like, keep doing it. So when I seen, when I did it for the first time, it was like, wow, like, I'm not dead. So I can keep doing this. Everything I've been seeing on the news and hearing about is a lie. <clears throat> so we were trapped in this room for we would only leave in the morning and be doing heroin to come down and then we would go get our drugs. But I experienced withdrawal for the first time and I'm sitting there and I'm like, I don't want to do drugs today. I'm like, I'm not feeling good. Like I'm sweating. My legs hurt. My back hurts. I feel like I'm about to vomit. And they're like, well, yeah, you've been doing heroin for the last two weeks. And I'm like, what's that got to do with anything? And they're like, you're going through withdrawal. And I'm like, what do you mean? And they're like, well, now that you've been doing it all day for two weeks, they're like, you need it so you stay off sick. And I didn't believe them at first, so I just kept pushing to see how long I could make it. And eventually it got really bad. And, you know, I said, okay, well, what can we do to get money? You know, and so I told my mom, I forget what I said, but I lied to her to get bucks. And we went and we did it, and I immediately felt better. From that point on, it was like, wow, like, if this is all I need to feel better again, I'm going to keep doing it, and I'm going to keep having fun, you know, with my drugs. So, I thought I was in the most picture-perfect relationship. I thought I met my person, you know, we got each other's names tattooed on us. We were always together. Girl, that's a <laughs> curse right there in itself. Yeah. You never get them anybody's name tatted on you. I don't know how many people I, I have. I mean, I've seen so many people do this, and the same thing happens is they get yeah. it, it curses you. I mean, I believe the minute you write it on you, it's like <sighs> curse. Yeah. <Curses. laughs> yeah, I swear. Because not long after that, it was like things got really abusive really fast. You know, it was physically abusive, mentally abusive, emotionally abusive, financially abusive. Like, Anything you can think of, abusive, even sexually in some ways, it was abusive. 
Um, so, you know, things just started going really downhill really fast at that point. But I still stayed. We were together for about for about seven years. For about seven years we were together. And, you know, I don't know. It just, there were times, like, so eventually, like, I went from dancing for drugs. I went to boosting or stealing for drugs. Then it was, I found online content, kind of like OnlyFans, but I had joined this. um, So this guy that we were staying with at this time, he was a part of this group that was called Nudes for Pizza. It was a private group on Facebook where like you had to be um, invited to it and allowed into the group. And you would post like teaser pictures or videos and then people would message you for your content. And so, you know, I was seeing all these girls on there and I was like, you know what, just let me give it a try. You know, we don't have a car. We don't have nowhere to go make no money. Let me just give it a try. And from there, it was like I was doing online content all day and all night into the early morning hours. Is it like kind of like camming like that? Like you would record like a video like on your phone or take pictures and like Mm -hmm. on it. And then send it to them. They then mow you the money or the money and then you send it. Okay. Gotcha. So I was doing that for money, making a lot of money doing it. And that was kind of like my first interaction with like selling myself for money. And eventually though, like I was a like not in a relationship, but I was like using the creator of this app for his money. And you know, eventually I kind of like wore that out a lot. Like we U hauled from Ohio to Las Vegas. And this guy that we knew was moving to California um, for his sugar mama. <laughs> That's what he said. For his sugar mama. And he left us in Vegas because we weren't sharing enough of our drugs. Like, Ugh. so he left us and we had to find our way to the airport. And I had to beg this dude for the money to get back. But he was like persistent i'm making me get a plane ticket to pennsylvania where he lived he's like if i'm paying for a plane ticket it's gonna be to my house and you're gonna live with me oh god and I was like, good. like well i didn't go i was like I you didn't, didn't okay good that would be like some you were going there and they're chopping you up like shit you know like I true crime god. shit i swear to god so I was like, I can't do that. But he ended up still sending me the money. And I forget what I said, but I like lied to him. I was like, I have to go home and like grab my insulin and like grab a bunch of stuff before I can come to you. So he ended up paying for a ticket from Ohio to Pennsylvania that I never got on. And from there, I was cut out of the group. Everything like blacklisted. Yeah. <laughs> so we had to find a new way for money. And so I heard of seeking arrangement. And I started getting into seeking arrangements. That's like and, professional, like escorting. I feel like really rich people do. Yeah, they do. They do. I I only had rich guys. And I also got into Craigslist and a bunch of shit because I was just so desperate for a lot of money. Even though I was making a lot of money, when we'd get it, it was gone. Like, we would blow it all. Mm-hmm. Your sound's off. <laughs> once you start getting your tolerance up it, you you spend through that money so fast because you're using you're pro, you're using all day and all night you know what i mean to do things to go out to go to the store to do whatever you need to do you're you have to be high all the time so the more money you make the more money you spend i feel like exactly it, it really was like that it was like we were spending money on halves and then it was grams and then it was like we just had We had a good, like, not, I want to say a good dealer, but, you know, he would front us a lot. Like, he would go out of town, (coughs) and he would front us, like, $400 (coughs) worth of it, and while we're just, like, making all this money back, you know, we think that we can make it last till he gets back, but it's gone. So, you know, and then I got into seeking arrangements, meeting a bunch of guys, and I had a really weird guy that I met. And it was like at this point, I was kind of like not liking what I was doing and liking who I was becoming. 
he would take me to like the sex bookstores, the ones with the glory holes. And <clears throat> he was gay, but he was married with kids. He was actually a high school history teacher. And he told me that. And he's like, I don't want my wife to know. I leave when everybody's asleep. And he would only hit me up at like one in the morning. And, you know, there was one night where I'm sitting there and he's like doing something to the dude through the glory hole. <laughs> and I'm like, I don't like this. Like I got really uncomfortable really fast. And I started crying and like having a panic attack. So I told him like I had to go to the bathroom and I let him come and find me whenever he was done. You know, he's asking me like if everything's okay. And I'm like, yeah, I just like, I'm feeling sick. So at that point I stopped seeing him but I just went and got high to like cover it. You know, I was like, I wasn't sure what I was feeling, what I wanted to do, where I would even go. It was like really a codependent relationship because in those seven years, I went to rehab a lot of times, um, tried to detox a lot of times at home in a center. And every time I would leave, I would go right back to them and we would just continue this cycle of, you know, being abusive and um, using drugs. And it wasn't just abusive on their part, you know, I was also abusive, but I still remember like a lot of things that they did to me and it still affects me to this day. I was the same way. I would get violent too, but yeah. a lot of it was provoked violence. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, I'm going to sock you in the face if you keep on poking at me. You know, like yeah. he would antagonize reactive. me. Yeah. It's active abuse. Like they would know what to say. They would know, like, they would control the drugs, even though I was the money maker to get all of them. They would be kept in a lockbox that I couldn't know the code to. And, like, they would spoon feed me however much I was allowed to have. And, like, oh, that would piss me off. Oh, it pissed me off. That I would break lock. the lock. I would break the lock. I would, I would be, I would go psycho. There, I did. I've used, like, I the, could not handle it. I've used my phone a couple times to, like, capture a picture of the code. And then, like, I would. <laughs> go down and say I'm going to the bathroom and like turn off all the power and be like oh well you got to go downstairs now to go fix the power and I would be up there like <laughs> <laughs> hurry up <laughs> seriously like I had a couple of guys that I dated during active addiction that would try to do that bullshit and I was like oh I, I one thing I when I was active addiction I was very I was just horrible in my active addiction I just did not like that. That was one thing I controlled. Cause so I always worked all the jobs. I always took care of the guys instead of the guys taking care of me or any, And so I was always in control of the money. I could not handle not being in control of it. You know what I mean? Yeah. And so I would always, and that's why I got in trouble so much. Cause I would come home and I would be really high yeah. and I would bring him like two pills. Well, uh <laughs> Yeah, there were times where they got stuck in jail, and you know, I'd be like, "Yeah, I got you. I went and I got money." Like, like, you know, it's like a little tiny bit. Yeah. <laughs> so, but I ended up meeting. Um, this was like a really scary time, where like it really started clicking in my head that like the sex work and like actually sleeping with people isn't what I wanted to do. I think this experience would be for anybody, but there was this guy from Bryan, Ohio, and he didn't, he had like a really old or a fake profile picture from what I remember. And he's like telling me he'll pay me so much money to go and see him. And he's like, I want you to come along. You know, I'm rich. I live in a good neighborhood. I don't want my, um, what do you call it? Like how people see you um ruin my reputation reputation ruined. yeah my reputation ruined and that should have been a red flag right there the fact that he wouldn't send me his address either he kept sending me like a gas station that was with so and so miles from his house but i ended up i didn't have a car so we had to get a ride from this older man that you know we would give heroin too for the ride me and my significant other and so i texted him when we were like five minutes from there i'm like Hey, I had to get a ride. My car wouldn't start. I'm really sorry. And then he's like, I really wish you would have told me because I would have never had you come and like, blah, 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 but I'll be there. And he pulled up in this really nice house, like really nice car. He dressed really nice. Like he seemed like a really chill dude. So I felt like 
all right, this is going to be an easy hour, like whatever. So we get, I get in his car. He um, gives them 40 bucks for gas and food, whatever, while they wait. And um, we get there and I see like a boat in his driveway, which is just really painting the picture a lot more. He had to get a code to get into his house, like the gate to get into the neighborhood, everything. So it's like painting the picture really nice for him. And so we get in there and he asked me if I want to drink. And I'm like, I only drink from an unopened bottle. Like I have to see you open it. He's like, do you smoke weed? And I told him no, because I didn't know what's in there. I'm trying to be really safe. And he's like, we're talking. And he's like, do you want to see the rest of the house? And I'm like, sure. So as we're going up the stairs, the first red flag that went off in my head is he's like, is the location on, on your phone? And I was like, yeah, why? And he's like, oh, I've just told you, like, I don't want my reputation ruined. I don't want your friend coming back here and making a scene at the gate, blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, they're not, like, they're fine. So we go to the right. We look at everything over there. We go to the left. I go into his bedroom. And I'm, like, looking around. And I'm like, I have to use the bathroom. And I go, he's like, there's one right in my room. You can use that one. But when I come out. He had locks on the doors that needed keys from the inside, and he had, like, a thumbprint lock on the door. So even if I got past those, I still wouldn't be able to get out. And I just kind of freeze. And, oh, so he heard me on the phone in there because my ex, well, my sick other at the time had called me and made sure I was okay because it was over the hour. And I'm like, yeah, like, we're just getting ready to start, blah, blah. So when I come out, like, he's like, who are you on the effing phone with? And this is before I could even notice the locks. And he, like, took my phone. And that's when I noticed, like, everything was locked up. And I'm like, what's going on? Like, what did I do? Like, it wasn't, they're not coming. It wasn't the cops. Like, I'm not the feds. Like, I thought that's what he thought. And, you know, he told me to get undressed and, like, he held a knife to my throat while I had to, like, make eye contact with him while he, like, jerked himself off. And so he told, after he was done, yeah, fucking weirdo. So after he was done, you know, he told me to get on the bed. And at that point, I'm like, okay, this is where, you know, I get raped and probably killed. He turned off the lights and laid on top of me like he was going to bed. And I'm like sitting there thinking like this is fucking weird man like he's got my phone like there's locks on the doors i can't even get out so like my mind went to you know if i'm not on my way to them in 15 minutes your house is going to be swarmed with cops and they're like how did you get my address because i drove around the other side of the house so you wouldn't see it and I was like, you left a piece of mail downstairs. And when you went to get me a fresh bottle, I took a picture and I sent it to my friend. And, you know, he jumped up really fast, unlocked the doors, told me to get dressed, told me to get ready. And he left his pants while he ran out. And I took the wad of money that was in his pants and I put it between my legs. And, you know, he didn't even stop the car when he got to the gas station. Like, that's how much of a frantic he was in. I had to tuck and roll out of the damn car. <laughs> and. Dude, he was going to kill you or something. Yeah. Yeah. I really feel it. Even to my gut this day, like, I escaped something really, really big, really scary. Um, I tried to report I mean, it. Because what was the point of locking you in there like that? Like, you were there voluntarily to do the job. Exactly. That's why I'm just thinking, like, maybe he thought I was on the phone with the feds and, like, now he's going to kill me for it or something. But, like, no, he was either going to try to keep me, chain me up, like, something. Like Something. He was a fucking weirdo. So, I tried to report it to Seeking Arrangements, and they did absolutely nothing. And instead took me down off of the website. So, at that point, it was like all right, like, fuck off. Like, there's obviously nothing I can do. I had warrants. Like, I'm an addict. Cops aren't going to believe me. Like, whatever. So I kind of let it go. And um, we just needed more shit for money. Like, we needed more things to do for money. And at that time, you know, my significant other was getting really pissed off with me because I didn't want to do it anymore because of that. And they didn't believe me that it happened because when we were done, they were like, oh, you seem really chill for someone who just almost got kidnapped. Like, you're making it up to try and get more drugs to get high and, like, blah, blah, blah. So they were like, 
they'd get really aggressive and really angry with me, like, when I wouldn't hit people up to, like, sleep with them or, like, go on dates, whatever. So I just felt, like, pressured. And then one day I got a message from somebody asking if they knew any boosters. And I was like, well, what do you need? And they sent me a list of stuff. And, you know, I went out and I got it all. And that's what started my boosting career. <laughs> Fucking, we had so many freaking people and dealers and everything else. Like, we were always go, 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 go. We were stealing so much. Well, I was. I was like the scapegoat. They would sit in the damn car and, like, oh, I'm listening to the police interview. <laughs> I understand. I was always up in there, too. My husband would be out. Well, my husband did it with me a couple times, but before I met him, I would always be the person that would go in. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, so I totally understand. And then there was a couple people every now and then that would be brave enough to do it, you know, yeah. or willing to do it. But it was always either me or like one other person. That was it. Sucked. Yeah, <laughs> yeah it really sucked because you're the only one getting arrested. <laughs> so, you know, we started that and it got to the point where I was stealing so much there that one of the Walmarts actually knew me by name. Like they, I was pushing out. So one of our dealers had, um, their sister was having twins. So they wanted two of everything baby matching. So I had to go on a search for this matching Graco baby swing. And this Walmart had it. Yeah. Yeah. Mike's not up here. Yeah, no, I need you to call him. Oh, I can't right now. I can't right now. I'm doing something. All right. Well, I'll wait until <clears throat> about the roll. All right. Um, so they called me by name as I was walking out. They were like, Carrie, Carrie Heck. And I was like, fucking booked it out of there. And then we're listening to the police scanner. And somebody had followed us from that Walmart. And they were like, they're turning down this road. They're turning down this road. So, like, we're driving to try to freaking get away from them. And we're on the... Um, expressway and our tire popped and there and we hear on the police scanner their tire just popped on i-75 north and like we're freaking out so we like get off the exit we go behind this ghetto ass gas station and i'm like freaking out because i'm like they know my name they know where we're at like i'm going we didn't end up getting caught for that one obviously they have to catch you and everything else to press charges but <laughs> fucking it scared me so at that point I was obviously like, we need to go elsewhere. So we like traveled to a different Walmart and they sent my picture out into a 50 mile radius. So when I walked into this Walmart, um, they acted like they knew nothing. And then when I walked out, seven cop cars swarmed me and I tried to run. So I tried to leave my ex before that. Um, we got into an argument and you know, they told me if I can't have you, nobody can. And they tried to choke me from behind. And like my vision started going blurry and I couldn't breathe. Everything went black. And I feel like if I wasn't smoking a cigarette, I wouldn't be here because I put a cigarette out on his face and he threw me down and I fractured my foot. So I tried to <laughs> run from the cops on a fractured foot. And obviously they caught me. <laughs> And, um, yeah, so I went to jail and while I was in jail, I had a dream and it was like the most vivid dream that I've ever had. And it was, I was sitting in jail and all these people that I knew would come in and they would leave, they'd come in, they'd go. And I'm like, when the fuck do I get to leave? So I walked up to the CEO and I'm like, Hey, when's my release date? And they're like, heck, you better get comfortable cause you're never leaving. And I just, like, woke up out of that dream, and I was already withdrawing, but, like, I was struggling to breathe. I was having a panic attack. And that moment, I was like, I need to get clean. Like, I cannot keep doing this. I'm miserable. I don't want to live anymore. I'm not happy. I miss my family. I miss my friends. Like, I can't do this. So I had the point that saved me, I think, was that, my ex at the time knew that I was trying to leave them and they went and they took a bunch of um, gabapentin pills or no, it was um, 
Seroquel pills. They went and took a handful of Seroquel pills trying to like off themselves. This is the baby. Thank you. I'm up. Chris is here to take me. So they tried to off themselves, but they were like so out of it that like me and my mom had to like get them to my car, put them in the car, and I drove them to their uncle's house. And from there, you know, I stopped at my dealers, went back to Michigan with my mom, and was like, I'm done. So I got into a rehab center called Brighton Center of Recovery or Brighton Center of Recovery of Michigan. And it's in Brighton, Michigan. And it's actually one that um, M&M had went to. They don't do smoking anymore, but like in the smoking room, his name is still written there. And that was the last time I went to a treatment center. And that was 11-20-2020. I spent my Thanksgiving in there. I went into precipitated withdrawal in there. And I that's the worst. Yeah. That's, I feel like that's worse than going through weather, regular withdrawal is it's all at once and there's no stopping it <laughs> so it was a really rough time but um i stuck it through no matter how much i wanted to leave i just knew that this is what i need to do and i did it and now here i am over two years clean i have a beautiful 13 month old biological daughter i have two well i have five other stepkids, but two of which I take care of on a regular basis, and they are three and seven. It was the little baby we just seen a few minutes ago. That's my 13-month-old. Okay, okay. That's because I was like, who's that little baby? <laughs> that's Miss Iris. Oh, Iris. Iris, that's so pretty. Thank you. And you had her, at well, obviously, after you got sober. Okay, that's awesome. I mean, even if you didn't, even if you had her before that, I mean, I, I had my son whenever I was, you know, still in my active addiction. <laughs> So, okay. So tell me now that you're sober and how do you stay sober? Like what kind of recovery do you do? We support all kinds of recovery here. So you can share whatever kind of recovery path works for you. Okay. Well, I'm on Matt. I'm on Suboxone. I have been consistently for the last two years. Um, sometimes I partake in marijuana, but I don't smoke every day. It's kind of just like, I know when I need to type of thing and I will. And I go to therapy. That's part of like my Suboxone doctor's requirement is that I'm in some sort of recovery or therapy program, which I need to find a new therapist. I really don't like mine. <laughs> I really don't like mine. I know. But I know how you, therapy for me, like I bro had to break away from the program therapy that I was in with like my Suboxone program and get like a therapist that was like separate from that. You know what I'm saying? I just, it was like, I was past, I got like, you're pretty much where I was at when I changed. So like, I feel like you can utilize those people there at the like Suboxone clinic for a while, but then you kind of grow out of that and you are on the next level of your recovery. You know what I mean? Yeah. So I was on probation um, for two years and I just got done with probation in January. They let me off a month early no violations, no freaking failed drug screens. I did it all. And um, so they wanted me to stay at that um, facility. Part of my probation limits was to be there. So now that I'm done with probation, the last two therapists I've had there, like treated it was, it was like their therapy session. Like it wasn't mine, it was theirs. So I need to find another one. So I go to therapy, I'm on mats. Um, I do smoke marijuana and I just have a really good support system. And if I need a meeting, I'll attend a meeting, but I haven't needed one in a minute and it's okay to like everybody that I talked to that's in recovery was like, you need to go to meetings, like you go to meetings for the rest of your life and like every day and blah, blah, blah. That's what they told me for a long time too, sister. I ain't been one since 2016 or 17. I haven't been to meetings for a minute. I mean, I do, I guess you could consider these like little meetings because yeah. like people come up here, like when, when I don't do like a video with somebody, like a guest like you, people will come on here and talk and we'll have multiple people come up. So it's kind of like a meeting, you know, but I believe that once you change your mindset and you don't want to use drugs anymore, you don't, you could do whatever you want to recover from there on out. I just you know. 
about that. There was that guy going around that's like, Matt's not clean and like, blah, blah, blah. And then I duetted it or stitched it or whatever. And I was like, not everybody abuses their Matt medication. I'm like, was I at one point selling Suboxone and not taking it as I was supposed to? Yeah. But my mindset was not how it is today where you have to change your people, places, things. You have to change your habits. You have to change everything about who you became an addiction to kind of get through that. Like, it's not the same for everybody. And not everybody can be on mat and be, like, responsible enough to take their medication every day, like, prescribed. And But if, you know, you truly do want to get clean you'll see that you know you won't keep misusing it so and how old are you 26 you're so mature for your age i believe i really do think that because i got i got arrested at 26 and went to prison by like 27 and i was so i feel like you're kind of mature i mean i would i feel like 26 is that middle age where you're like you could still be partying you know yeah i mean i've been mature my whole life it was like once I got like sexually abused as a kid, it was like all that innocence and childlike left me. It was like I wanted to hang around the adults and I just, you know, and I grew up. With my mom, you make like, me emotional, girl. <laughs> I'm like that, that you should have had to feel like that. You know what I mean? You need to find a therapist that's trauma informed, a trauma informed therapist that can like. So that way you're in there and you're telling them these things and they're helping you with ways to like heal from those things, you know? Yeah. I think I a really good therapist like five years ago when I was like, obviously I wasn't then, but um, I was for the time I seen her and she was amazing. You know, she was helping me work on that inner child trauma and I started seeing like a glimpse of hope and like my silly side come back out and like wanting to have fun and not taking things so serious. And then, you know, I got back into using drugs. And then by the time that I got clean again, um, you know, my, she didn't take my insurance. So it's been like a battle trying to find like the right therapist, but I know there's, there's one out there. I just have to find them. And you know, I give a, not a lot of my credit, but I went to Oxford House. So when I left treatment um, in 2020, I stayed a month there. And then I went to Oxford House in December. And it was like, you had a lot of freedom. Like they didn't try to control you. You had like um, times where you had to be home by like curfews. You had to get a job. You had to pay your rent on time. You had to go to a certain amount of meetings. They gave you a house job like they held like they held you to what you said and they held you accountable. So I really appreciate how it was there because you could come and go as you wanted. Like you didn't have to say, can I go here? Can I get a pass for here? Like it wasn't like that. So I really loved it there because of that. Like I was able to find myself a little bit into recovery and I was there for like six months or so and I got a sponsor in that time I went to a lot of meetings and then when I left it was like my sponsor kind of started falling off for me she was dating like the house manager like someone who managed a bunch of the houses and I don't know it just it wasn't the same you know and I felt like because I left that she just kind of fell off. So that's kind of what ended the meeting journey for me in a way. But at that point, it was like I was ready to anyway. Um, I still went to some here and there. So I went to meetings like my first seven or eight months of my recovery. And then I, I think that's, I mean, I feel like that's a good amount of meetings. That's almost a year long, a year of meetings. And then like, just because you're, you and your sponsor didn't work out, like there's always people like me that you could have like to text and be like, hey, like accountability partners is what I call them. And I have so many, like I could text any of my people from my um, YouTube and TikTok that I'm friends with and be like, bitch, I want to get high. And they're going to be like on the phone with me right away. What do you mean you're you want to get high? You know what I mean? So like you find other ways to have that sober support. So don't don't be like, I mean, it's okay. If you don't think you need to go to meetings, that's, there's nothing wrong with that. You know what I'm saying? You just okay. find what works for you. And like, 
double down on that. But I'm telling you, you got me now. You got my cell phone number. So if you ever are struggling, you could always send me a message and I will help you no matter what. If I see it says I'm struggling, then I will come back. I will respond right away. You know what I'm saying? Because I know how serious that is. I'm super proud of you, dude. Like, so 2020 in December or November, you said? In 2020. So for, for Thanksgiving. Hell yeah. Hell yeah. You're doing the damn thing. I'm doing it. I never thought I'd be here. Like, I for real wanted it so bad, but it, I didn't think that I would be able to. Like, I didn't have that, I guess, like, support within myself and believe in myself that I'd be able to. But you just take one day at a time, and then before you know it, you're looking back and it's like, wow, it's been five months. It's been yep. eight months been a year like and it's crazy because I never thought that I'd see the day where I have over two years because I was like I was the worst person in addiction I was a bitch I couldn't be trusted you know I would steal your socks off your feet and help you look for them and it's like my family wanted nothing to do with me now I have a relationship going again with my sister I see her all the not all the time but more a lot more I have a relationship again with my mom where nobody's like questioning me like if I'm tired because I'm an overwhelmed mom they're not like are you high <laughs> like what did you take <laughs> so they trust you you have you gained everybody's trust back I have to ask you a question that I ask everybody that comes on and I want you to think about this before you answer it so I want you to think about the person that's watching this video back they might watch it two days from now they might be watching it right now they might watch it a year from now and I want you to think about them and they're sitting there and they're listening to your story and they're getting high, but they don't want to get high anymore. What would be some suggestions that you would give somebody that's struggling, that doesn't know how to reach out for help or how to start their recovery journey? I would say that if you have family that would support you no matter what to reach out to them and tell them like, Hey, I think I'm ready this time. If you don't, you know, there's a bunch of treatment centers. You can call your insurance and talk to somebody over the phone and find out if you can get in there. Um, and if you don't have insurance to get in, there's outpatient programs that will help you get on medication and also wean you off if medication isn't what you want. Um, even if you don't want to get on, you know, methadone or suboxone, there's other ways like the Vivitrol shot or the Supplicate shot that are really great options that help with your cravings and that help you not, you know, want to use. And cravings never go away. And that's one thing I want everybody to know before they get into recovery is that cravings are here forever. And it's one thing that really sucks. And if I could get rid of them for everybody, I would. But what does change over time is how strong they get. And how much more power you hold to say no to those, like, and to go easy on yourself. Did y'all hear that? Thank God you couldn't hear that. The Our, our fire alarm just went off out of nowhere. <laughs> yeah, I think it was this red one right here. That's I was looking at my husband going, are you cooking something? Okay, I'm sorry. I love you, girl. You did a really good job sharing your story. I have to tell you, like, that shit with that dude locking you in that room with a freaking thump. You are probably going to be on an episode of like, you know, serial killers or whatever. On but Like, I that was some real shit. My brother was with me that day and he was watching over he me. He was. He was protecting you. Think quick, bitch. Or you're gonna be Get out of here. <laughs> Like, I full-heartedly believe that, so I'm grateful to be here. Hell yeah. I just want to thank you so much for coming on here and sharing with us. Is it okay if I put this on my YouTube channel? Are you cool with that? Thank you for having me. Okay, text me later. I love you, okay? Love you, too. Bye. All right, bye, baby. Uh, you guys. 
Bam. If you didn't, if y'all haven't been here re- listening to her whole story, rewind it back because she had a, she has a really, really good story. And a lot of you guys that are doing sex work or that have been in the sex working industry will be able to really relate to her story. I think too, you know, I love you guys and I support you no matter what you're doing. I, I support you if you're in recovery and still doing sex work. I want y'all to know that. Okay. I don't judge anybody. I love you guys just the way you are. Um, but I think that her story is powerful and it shows a lot of the things that can happen, you know, in that industry and what to look out for and to, and to keep yourself safe. Also, we ha- this is Carrie's not the first person who's come on here and shared about being abused as a child and telling her family and her family not supporting her. Okay, so if you're a family member and you have children or if you're a mom and dad or aunt and uncle or grandma and grandpa, listen to kids when they tell you that they're being abused. Okay, when it when a child comes to you to tell you something like that, they had to work up the courage to get that up off their chest and to ignore them or to put them on the spot in front of their abuser. That fucking shit pisses me off. But I love you guys. I hope you enjoyed Carrie's story. I'm going to shut the broadcast off because my little boy's over there. I can hear his uh, TV loud and clear. And I know y'all probably don't want to hear it. And today's Monday. I kind of surprised y'all with this upload. So sorry that I, I meant to come in the tele, uh, t- to the Telegram chat and tell y'all. But by the time I made the link, me and Carrie were like 30 minutes away from going on live. And I just psh, forgot about it. But um. Wednesday, I will have a video uploaded in Patreon for my patrons all about um, what to do if you have a loved one that's drinking alcohol or a loved one that's relapsed or a significant other or somebody that's in your life, you know, that will be on Patreon. And then Friday or Saturday night when I go live for our Patreon live, it will be about that topic. So look forward to that, you guys. I'm going to have it up by Wednesday. It'll probably go up tomorrow afternoon. If you want to join me tomorrow to do makeup, I'll be live here on Facebook at about nine o'clock in the morning to do our makeup together. Okay. All right. I love you, Paco. Paco's sleeping, but he says he loves you guys too. Bye y'all.